Welcome, everybody. Uh, imagine you're a student, and you've spent the better part of the last two semesters building your aerospace project. Now you're quite fed up with it, and you need a way to get it away from you as quick as possible, as far as possible. What better than using a balloon or even a rocket? Exactly for this, there's Rexus and Bexis. And if you're wondering who is crazy enough to travel to the high north, freezing their fingers off, setting it all up, well, just talk to Panic and Seth and give them a warm round of applause. So welcome to our talk on the Rexus and Bexus project, which is one way to get your student experiments into space, or if you're a teacher, you can um, propose a topic for your students to do so. Um, we both are simple students from Jena and Munich, and we are not talking in the name of the Rexus and Bexus program or the organizers. Uh, we just share our insights as participants in the program. So, Basically, Rexus and Bexus is your flight ticket into space for an experiment that you designed. The program Rexus and Bexus is realized under a bilateral agency agreement between the German Aerospace Center uh, DLR and the Swedish National Space Board SNSB, which is somehow the counterpart, uh, the Swedish of the German DLR. Um, furthermore, the Swedish share of the payload has been made accessible to teams from ESA, and also, um, there are a lot of organizations involved in this project that support the teams in the design and development of their experiments. So first, for the REXUS, REXUS stands for Rocket Experiments for University Students. And it's basically a cheap launch system um, with two launches per year. Uh, these are Formerly, so these uh, rocket motors are formerly uh, military rockets, surface to air rockets um, that are repurposed to uh, lift the, the scientific payload instead of warheads. Basically, we can, or these rockets can carry up to five experiments, and they are unguided rockets, so there's no active um, vector thrust control, for example. Um, and they are simply spin stabilized. And the scientific payload mass is about 30 kilograms. So um, you, as you can see, there are several modules there. And um, basically, normally, there are uh, four modules as these, as these ring modules. And there may be one um, behind uh, or below the, the nose cone. Then there are Spexus. Spexus experiments are um, simple balloon experiments, so atmospheric research balloons. You have a gondola where you can put your experiments inside. These are up to six experiments per balloon. And uh, the plastic balloon is just uh, filled with helium, and it then goes up to about uh, 35 kilometers in height. And you have still communication during the flight with your experiments. So all these launches take place from Kiruna Space Center in uh, northern Sweden, near a town called Kiruna. Um, just that you have a rough estimate where it is. So if you go there in summer, it looks like this. Um, basically, that's also one of the reasons to have the Space Center there there's a lot of nothing. So if the payload and the motors fall back to ground, uh, no one is hurt. And so it is a safe place to be. You also see in the foreground this uh, big pad, the balloon pad. Uh, that's where the, the balloons are launched. And in the background, where you have, uh, you're basically in the center of the image, uh, there's the rocket launch pad. And there are multiple uh, launches there uh, for different rocket types, um, because there are, of course, there are not only Rexus rockets launch, uh, launched there, but also uh, other technology experiments. So how about all the organizations involved? So um, this table shows somehow a, a rough estimate of how these organizations work together. 
um, they make bridge the borders to, to other services. So basically from, from the beginning on there's uh, the DLR space administration involved and SNSB involved as basically financial um, yeah, um, or, or providing the, the financial um, capital to just uh, conduct the experiments and the flights and uh, costs for travel and so on. So, um, and also in this case also ESA for the Swedish share. They are all involved in the project management, so they basically lay out how the, uh, the project uh, phases are, which uh, dates to use, and so on. Then there comes a subcontractor, which is SAR, which is the Center of Applied Space Technology and Microgravity in Bremen. Uh, they have a drop tower facility where you can do um, microgravity experiments, and they are also involved in the uh, REXUS and BEXUS program here. They basically are then uh, advising all the teams throughout their project and are the, the direct uh, partners to talk to if there are problems. The other organizations are, of course, still visible, so they are uh, involved, for example, in the decision process uh, which uh, experiment should be selected, uh, but they are not directly involved, usually, um, in the design of the experiments. Then there's DLR Moraba, which is another part of DLR, namely the mobile rocket base. They are responsible for doing the launch together with SSC, the Swedish Space Corporation. Uh, SSC owns S-Range, for example. So um, they are providing all the, the necessary infrastructure for the launch, the launch itself, uh, the rocket motors, and so on. So there are a couple of phases of the project, as I already mentioned. So first of all, the first step is the selection workshop. So you have, uh, submitted a proposal to the REXUS and BEXUS committee, and they decide um, whether it looks interesting what you're doing, wh whether it, it looks feasible uh, with given time uh, constraints or financial constraints. And if your experiment gets selected, there are several uh, design reviews or reviews. These are uh, usually at the end uh, to, or at the end of, of one part of the project to fulfill one milestone, and they are um, going with increasing granularity uh, on just the, the details uh, as your project evolves. So for example, at the preliminary design review, they are usually just the, the rough plan still, um, but not a final project yet, and nothing tested yet, so to say. And so this uh, just goes on until the bench test, uh, for example, which is one of the tests where all the experiments are connected together, and uh, it's basically just some uh, a couple of months before the launch campaign. So I was involved in the FOFS experiment. We did fiber optic vibration sensing uh, on board such a, a rocket, which was uh, REXUS 15, uh, which was also last year in summer. Uh, we were a bunch of students from the uh, TU Munich. And basically, the, the core team were six people, one PhD student, four ordinary undergraduate students, and one pupil. So the experiment involved some, some laser optics uh, or, or lasers and fiber optics, circuit design, software had to be written, and so on. So what did we want to do? So basically, we used uh, fiber optical sensors to do vibration sensing. And vibration sensing means effectively measuring acceleration. So how can you use a fiber to measure something? One of these possibilities is a so-called fiber break grating. A fiber break grating is, in principle, a normal fiber, but with the difference that it does not transmit all light from one end to the other, but it has an ins inscribed periodic change of the refractive index. So this you can see with these, these uh, dishes inside the, the fiber. These basically 
make the fiber behave in a way that one w specific wavelength that we call the, uh, the Bragg wavelength is reflected to the input side. And of course, on the transmission side, you see an absorption line. So that alone would not allow us to measure anything. But this Bragg wavelength depends on the temperature, for example. So if we increase the temperature by one Kelvin, we see a shift in the peak wavelength of this uh, Bragg wavelength uh, by 10 picometers. And the same way, if you take a one meter long fiber and expand it to, uh, by one micrometer, you see also a shift in one picometer of the wavelength. So this way, we can, for example, attach a seismic mass to the fiber, and if some force uh, acts on the mass, we see an extension of the fiber, so um, the, uh, we see a sh shift in the wavelength, and if we follow the shift in the wavelength, we can calculate the acceleration on this mass. So what are benefits of this technology in, for space? So first of all, these allow to build quite lightweight sensor systems. If you compare that, for example, to normal uh, resistive strain gauges, uh, we don't need isolation on the cables because this is just a fiber and we don't have any interference uh, or electromagnetic uh, compatibility issues uh, with other, uh, other electronics around. Also, there are no sparks, so we can place it quite close to propellants, for example, or we could put, or th we could think of a fiber that we just put on uh, the complete rocket and have also multiple sensors inside this fiber. And we uh, don't get any issues with the, the present um, parts that are around this. So there already exist um, studies on uh, papers on how to use fiber optics or fiber break ratings for space applications. But these, these are mainly uh, lab setups. So these are not tested in flight. And there are only a few uh, examples where this was done. So we thought whether it is possible to operate such an FPG, fiber break rating measurement system, on a rocket. and. Uh, just see how it, how it turned out. So these were our fiber optical sensors. So the first one is the acceleration sensor. This one is uh, a sensor that we, that we bought. We also developed our own, wa own one, but we couldn't use it in the end. So we need uh, to use the, the fallback solution. Um, the overload capability is plus minus 50 G, which is important, but you will see later. Normally the rockets, so there's a, um, a REXUS uh, manual that has several specifications on the rocket, and it says that the expected maximum acceleration is about 20 or 25 G. So uh, this should be sufficient, we thought. Then uh, we also have one uh, fiber optical temperature sensor that you can see here, and there's also attached nearby the reference sensor. For the accelerometer, we also, we also need a reference sensor, which is, uh, was a normal MEMS-based electrical sensor that was placed close to the fiber optical sensors and a lot of other temperature uh, sensors around the, the module. So how, how does such an optical system with these fiber break ratings work? So first of all, we have a, a light source that produces a very wide band of, uh, or broad band of infrared light. Uh, this was done by a normal pump laser and an erbium doped fiber. So then this very broad light uh, goes through a fiber coupler and is split up into three beams that then go to each of our three sensors. So two uh, accelerometers, fiber optical ones, and uh, one temperature sensor. So from there, uh, it goes through a 50-50 coupler and to the sensor. From there, the light go gets reflected and goes back through the coupler and comes to a so-called interrogator chip. The interrogator chip basically measures in the first path. Uh, it has an edge filter in front of, uh, of the light and a diode. And so we can measure the photocurrent of the diode and we know basically that the peak wavelength of um, the, the break rating. 
because also the light source might have some fluctuations in the intensity that, uh, of light that it produces, we also need a reference of the total emitted light that we received. So we also have one path without the edge filter to have an absolute number, um, what was the, the input uh, light basically for, for our sensor. So this is such a Rexus rocket. The rocket is about six meters long. Uh, our experiment was directly under the nose cone um, or below the nose cone, not, with, not within the nose cone. The nose cone was empty. And below us, there were three other experiments. There was, for example, Medusa from the University of Rostock, uh, Strassat R2 uh, from the University of Strathclyde, and an experiment called Isaac from KTH Stockholm. As you can see, there are some, some silver parts uh, on it, so these are hatches, because all these three experiments had so-called free-falling units. These are ejectables that you can eject from the rocket that then fly, uh, fly down um, the, the normal way. So these are, for example, they can be used to test CubeSats which was the case for Strassat. Therefore, you have these uh, 10 to 10 um, centimeter hatches um, for, for Strassat. Then there's the rocket service module that's from Moraba and the recovery module that's also from Moraba. So every experiment gets uh, several um, uh, interfaces, for example, power, for example, a data downlink, uh, provided from the service module and the data is then transmitted by the service module to the ground station. And then below the recovery module, there's uh, the improved Orion motor. So how did, did our experiment look like? As you can see, um, it is basically just this, this uh, module with uh, 356 millimeters in diameter. And we have a power supply there, and we have the light source, as I said. And from there, the light goes to the fiber couplers throughout, through this uh, beam splitter. So you can see um, that there are three couplers, and basically the black part uh, below the orange uh, fiber cables that are uh, yeah, rolled up there. Um, is below is the uh, one of the one to three uh, splitters, and then we get three output signals. So from each of the fiber couplers, we go uh, one or one goes to the temperature sensor, and the other two go to the accelerometers. And uh, from there, it goes back to the fiber couplers, and one way goes, of course, back to the light source, but we ignore that, and the other part goes to the interrogator chips. From there, it goes on to PCBs through several filter stages and to a microcontroller that then stores all the data on an SD card and also transmits part of it down to the ground station. So that's this onboard data handling part. So how does such a launch look like? This is the view from the so-called science center. So there are basically two locations where you can be during such a, a rocket launch uh, because there are, of course, uh, safety regulations there. So one is the science center, which uh, this recording comes from, uh, which is about one kilometer away from the launch site. And then there's uh, the so-called radar hill, which is about two or a bit more kilometers away. And as you can see, basically from the science center, so you don't see that much. But we also had other experiments on the rocket. So uh, they also had a camera on board the rocket, and we can also see the view from inside the rocket to the outside. So first of all, the rocket that you see there is not our rocket that is flying. That was just another empty rocket that was placed there that's normally uh, below the, the tower, and they just moved away the tower a bit.
So um, the the sound in the end, you probably noticed it uh, stopped. So uh, first of all, you notice the spinning, uh, which is at a rate of about four hertz. That's just to stabilize the rocket during the flight, because as I said, it is unguided. Then uh, you probably noticed that we were above the clouds after about uh, seven seconds. And uh, the other uh, thing you noticed is the sound that um, somehow probably sounded, uh, yeah, you, you probably don't know where it comes from. It's uh, just the air that flows out of the modules because of the lower pressure outside. So that's basically the sound that you can hear. And in the end, um, you also hear that there was uh, the this, this sound disappeared. That's because there was not enough air anymore for the microphone to work. And then we have a third one. Um, this is. So uh, this was done by Moraba, and so it goes, so that was another rocket, but they mounted a camera on top the rocket launcher, and just see how it goes. So uh, it goes quite fast. <laughs> so um, we had, uh, so now to our results, we uh, first had the temperature measurements and you can see that there's some spike from the fiber. So the first thing is uh, both me measurements are uh, quite close together. So the, the sensing is correct, we can say. The other thing is that we notice is that at basically lift off time, t plus zero seconds, uh, we have a spike in, from the fiber optical sensor, which is basically because the fiber acts as, uh, as an accelerometer in this case, because there's still a small mass attached to the fiber, um, but still it's a mass, so we can measure, or we can see the acceleration inside this temperature profile. The other part is that we have uh, the acceleration from our normal sensor and the fiber optical sensor, and we see that something bad happened. So at the beginning, everything seems still fine, but then at liftoff, something changes. So what has happened? Uh, so uh, that was the, the flight direction, so the Z, uh, the Z axis, and basically six, uh, 60 milliseconds before we get the official liftoff signal, that's the time between ignition and the, the rocket moves, basically, um, we see a very high acceleration that exceeds our uh, breakdown um, force for, the, uh, for our accelerometers, the fiber optical ones, and um, basically the, the, fi uh, the, the sensor uh, could not reset into the old position, so some parts inside uh, were damaged, and so we had an offset of minus 20 g around. But still, uh, there were there were some there was some signal, and we can adjust it by by rescaling and adjusting the offset of the fiber back to the normal profile, so we can see that we reached about uh, 30 g uh, of of acceleration. Of course, this is outside the spec of the accelerometer, so these are not uh, fully trustable values, but that just shows that there's uh, quite some energy at the start, at least, um, that exceeds the normally measured uh, uh, acceleration values. So the outcome was that, on the one hand, we can operate such a fiber break rating based measurement system on this rocket, but on the other hand, there are still some problems that need to be solved or need to be avoided in the future um, that have to do with um, yeah, issues that you normally don't see if you uh, sample uh, too slow, uh, that you can see these very high accelerations at the beginning.
Okay, so now I will talk about the Acker team. We were a team of, um, or quite a small team of five engineering students from Jena in uh, the eastern part of Germany. And um, the basic idea behind Acker was that we wanted to build an ADSB receiver um, to place it, for example, in a satellite, because in a densely populated area, for example, at the Atlantic or so, there's no really um, control of the aircrafts which are flying there. And the idea was that we wanted to build a small receiver which can operate, for example, at the satellite. And um, the goal was that we receive um, these ADSB data, which are transmitted from airplanes every second, nearly every second, um, during a BEXOS flight and um, wanted to test the experiment during the flight. And we chose um, the BEXOS flight because we had much more longer time where we can measure um, these airplanes. And one other question was, um, we are in a pretty height of uh, 30 kilometers or so, so from which distance can we receive any airplanes anymore? So that's a very rough um, overview of the ARCA experiment. So we have our airplanes, which are transmitting these ADS-B signals every second. And um, then we have the ARCA experiment, um, which receives these data. Um, we are saving the data on board. And then there's an E-Link, or so-called E-Link module in the um, BEXOS balloon. And um, we can transmit the data back to Earth and see it in the ground, sta uh, ground station and also save the data there. Here's another topic. We have our ADSB data, which are coming from the outside. And we have, um, at the outside of our um, gondola, we have the antenna mounted. And um, then we have the ADSB receiver, which is in our um, module. And uh, we have an FPGA where we do all the signal processing stuff and um, decoding the frames, which are coming from the airplanes. And then we have a small ARM computer, which uh, saves the data and also downlinks the data down to Earth. And also we could um, talk to the experiment and um, um, set some com commands during the flight. The electrical concept is relatively simple. Um, we have an RF receiver. Um, the, the data is sent at a frequency of around 1.1 gigahertz. So we are filtering the data. We, are amplific uh, we have an amplification stage. Then we have a few other filters and amplifiers. And um, then we have a logarithmic detector, and the data from the logarithmic detector um, directly um, is input in an ADC, um, analog to digital converter, and then we are doing the signal processing stuff in the FPGA. And um, the FPGA um, sends the decoded data via a serial um, connection to the ARM computer where we can save it and um, store the data. And we had an Ethernet, or an Ethernet um, connection because this E-Link is mainly um, a, a Wi-Fi connection, something like that. It has a little bit more power than a Wi-Fi connection, but basically it's a Wi-Fi connection. Um, we had some problems uh, with the uh, front end. We used in, uh, in the first prototype, we used the so-called mini RDSB. You can take a look at the internet, it's uh, well documented. And um, the problem was that there was only one amplifier and it oscillates a lot. So um, we uh, split the amplification into two stages and then we had no problems with amplification and so on. And you can see here, uh, that's our second prototype. Um, and there uh, the amplification is um, put into two stages. Um, we built a, a, a baseboard or a so-called baseboard. Um, we had an FPJ on um, underneath it, and um, the baseboard contains the um, the RF receiver. You can see it here. You can see here the ADC, the analog to digital converter, and um, that's our ARM computer, which was also developed by us, and um, it uh, was stacked on top of that. The uh, board computer was developed by Hannes. It, he's uh, one of our team members um, during his master thesis, and it runs Linux, and is, uh, it was designed for low power consumption, so it also fits in our uh, concept that we wanted to build a, um, a receiver which consumes basically nothing or not really a lot of energy. Um, you can see here, a chart where we uh, put all together. So in total, we had a power consumption less than one watt. So we think that's quite okay. 
Um, but for example, if we would use the experiment during a satellite flight, then um, the Ethernet connection wouldn't be needed anymore. So um, the power consumption could be reduced further because um, the Ethernet connection consumes the most energy in the whole experiment. Um, mechanical, we built um, a quite a simple mechanical or a, a metal box. You can see it here in the, in the left um, where we have the connector, connectors outside from the left. There's the um, RF connector where the antenna is mounted. Then we have the power connection and um, on the right we have the Ethernet connection and uh, three LEDs where we could see some um, indicators or some errors, for example, when, we, when, the, um, uh, when the experiment was modded in the gondola. Um, a look inside of the box, um, it was really only this um, metal box and we had here our, our baseboard, our arm computer and that's the RF connection which, which goes directly in the front. And uh, here we had an ESD uh, material only for isolation and um, thermal, thermal isolation of the, uh, during the flight. In uh, October last year, the experiment, uh, experiment was started from s -Range. You saw some pictures before. Um, at uh, 10.51, we uh, reached a floating level of around 28 kilometers, but uh, we had a lot of, um, well, we had a strong horizontal winds, so the balloon had to be cut down at 12 o'clock. Um, the problem is that they are not allowed to fly um, in the Russian sector. So uh, we landed, or later we landed then in uh, Finland and it was uh, good luck that we landed there. <laughs> um, that's a picture of our gondola. Um, you can say here that was our small experiment. Um, that's the power box where the batteries are located inside. And that's the so-called E-Link module, um, which is basically a Wi-Fi connection. And that was, um, Another experiment from, I think, Bologna, um, I-5. Um, they, do, uh, they have done some uh, meteorological measurements in the atmosphere during the uh, floating phase. Um, to the results, um, basically the experiment worked uh, very well. We uh, could track a lot of airplanes during the flight. And in total, we received around 200,000 uh, Mod S messages. And um, in total, there are around 110 unique uh, airplanes we could see. And the maximum distance was around 620 kilometers. But we expected uh, more. We expected uh, a distance from around 1,100 kilometers. And uh, the problem was that we had some dropouts with our, um, in our airflink. So we think that we had a broken antenna connection, with, which was mostly or likely um, due to a um, mechanical problem, due to transport or so. Here's a picture during the flight. Um, here you can see that that was the airplane which um, was from the highest um, distance, 620 kilometers around. And that's here in the middle, that's Kiruna and also Kiruna Airport. Um, in blue, we have uh, the valid most S messages we received during the flight. And um, um, that at this time, we had the launch. And um, um, the count of um, mode S messages uh, um, uh, increases a lot. And then we had this degradation you can see during the flight. And we think that, that, uh, that that's the reason because of the broken antenna connection. So from time to time, we had a lot of messages we received. And then, for example, for two minutes, the, the, um, the count of uh, messages dropped out completely or nearly completely. So we had really problems with our antenna. But all in all, we received a lot of um, airplanes. And we could say, OK, the experiment is working well, actually. Uh, terminal behavior, we uh, mounted six equator C uh, sensors in the experiment to monitor the temperature. And um, at the launch pad, um, or during the experiment, when it was on the launch pad, the uh, temperature rises. And then, of course, we are, the, the balloon was rising, and the temperature was rising until around it was the outside temperature at minus 40 degree. And then the gondola was moving slowly into the sun. And then the sun was um, 
shining directly on our experiment, so um, the temperature rises again. Okay, so we made a short um, time lapse movie. Sorry, I have no, I have no um, real movie of uh, the, the launch, and nobody in the team had a, a movie um, of the balloon uh, start. But we made a short time lapse. Uh, we can see here in the in the right the yellow car that's uh, Hercules. Uh, Hercules um, is the launch vehicle at S range. Um, you can see the gondola which is mounted there, and um, the balloon is on the left. Okay, um, during the or after the flight, we um, we played all the data we received and uh, made a, a small time lapse movie where you can see. <laughs> Um, the airplanes uh, flying around uh, Sweden and Norway. Different interesting thing is, for example, to show you only one thing is, for example, you, see you have here Kiruna Airport and you see um, airplanes which are flying to Kiruna, land and fly again. And of course you can see a lot of um, airplane routes or streets um, in the air, uh, which you can, which we could track during the whole flight. Okay, um, if you have or if you want to build an experiment or and you want to participate in the Rexus Bexus program, you maybe ask yourself now. How could I do that? And um, we think the first idea is that you have to get an idea. And um, we have only written some questions down. For example, um, was the experiment uh, in similar kind already flown? Um, can we improve the early experiment which was flown um, some years ago or so um, again? And do you need external support um, which is critical for your experiment? For example, do you need any labs which cannot, pro cannot be provided by um, the Rexus-Bexus program or do we need extra finance uh, support and so on and so on. And um, we think that it's, in the first hand, it's important that you find uh, people who are uh, motivated to um, work in, the, in this project. For example, um, Bex's projects uh, are running for around 10 or 11 months, whereas um, Rex's programs are running for 12 months, no, 13, 18, 18 months. So that's a lot of time and you have to do it or mostly all during the um, during your um, study at university. So you also need um, people who are motivated. That's a very important thing in the Rexus Bexus program. And um, we can say from previous uh, Rexus Bexus uh, experiments, um, mostly the problem is that they um, people lost the team or left the team, and uh, the, the team had a lot of problems with the workload, which has to be done until the launch campaign. So um, the next possibility to uh, write a call for a proposal or to, to write a, um, a paper for the um, selection workshop um, opens in summer 2016. And uh, for German uh, students, you should, you, you must not, but you should write a letter of intent until um, um, the beginning of August next year. And uh, for European students, they should register at the uh, ESA Education Project database and um, write down that they want to participate in the program. And for details, you should see at rexuspexus.net um, because there's everything listed and you can read it later. Okay, some acknowledgements. Uh, we have the first team that were the team members of the first team, Arca. Um, we were this team. Um, thanks to the guys who brought us these images and so on. Um, and the videos uh, you saw, for example, from uh, the Rexus rocket, were from the Isaac experiment and from DLA Moraba. And if you read, uh, if you want to read a little bit more, we have um, some web pages uh, written down. And if you have questions or so, talk to us later or write us an email. Do we have some time left? 
5 minutes 15. Sollen wir noch ein paar Fotos zeigen? Ja. Willst du? Yes. Okay, yeah. So we can show uh, just a few uh, images uh, from the campaign. Uh, and then we do a Q&A. So this is the, the team photo of the Rexus 15 and 16 uh, teams that were, that were there. So you see these are quite a lot of people involved. And these are, were only the people that were sent to the launch campaign. Uh, there may be or there are even more people involved in the project itself. Um, this is uh, again the photo but for Rexus 18 and 19. So again, a lot of people. Maybe we can, we can open for Q&A now. Thank you very much for this talk. Please give them a warm round of applause. If you have any questions, please line up at the four microphones we have here. And while you're doing this, uh, off to the signal angel relaying a question from IRC. We currently have a question uh, regarding funding um, and regarding the costs involved uh, with launches. Can you uh, maybe elaborate a bit uh, on the costs for launching with Rexus or Bexus, maybe as cost per kilogram or so, and uh, the total funding for such a launch? So uh, I don't know the, the total funding, but the launch itself is free. So that's paid by the Rexus Bexus, so that's free for the teams. Basically, what the teams have to pay, um, or no, the, the teams also get uh, some money, for example, to build the modules and uh, some specific parts uh, that are built, for example, by ZARM or by other companies where you just uh, buy these things. And everything that exceeds that amount, I don't have an exact figure, a couple of thousand euros, um, that then has to be paid by your own or you have to develop it by your own or you need a lab of your university or some, some machines of your university. So um, there you can, can just see um, yeah, wh where you can uh, get other support or other sponsors uh, for these parts. A question from the front right microphone. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, hello, uh, I have a question regarding the fiber optic uh, measurements uh, you did um, because you explained that it has some advantages, uh, for example, that it can be built very light white. Now my question is, um, did your experiments um, had, or do you hope that your experiment will have some effect on uh, the development of these um, measurement systems for actual emissions from NASA or the DLR, for example, some kind of fiber optic measurements being done on ISS. So what, what lies in the future? So I don't know of, of any uh, specific plans or, or things, but um, so we, we see that there, there are some problems with the fiber optics, but in total, uh, due to the, due to that, that you don't need no um, or isolation from the, of the fibers um, compared to electrical cables. Uh, so that uh, there, there might be some, uh, some programs, but nothing specific that, that I know of. Can I ask a follow-up question, a short one? Yes. Can you give a rough estimate on how much uh, weight you can save uh, in comparison to a, a uh, the models used currently for measurements? Not by heart, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, front left microphone. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm interested in some numbers for both Rexus and Bexus. Uh, what's the kind of flight duration you can achieve and uh, what about the maximum altitude? Yeah, so the altitude, I think we had that on the, on the slide, is for uh, the Rexus rockets about 80 or 70 to 90 kilometers. So it depends, of course, on the mass of the rocket. And usually you try to get all the experiments that started for this rocket also on the rocket, that you don't have to fly an empty experiment. Um, so therefore you probably uh, just take away some of the hate and just and take the, uh, the heavier uh, experiment. But uh, so our flight, because all our modules were quite heavy, our flight was uh, only up to 80.7 80 kilometers. 
but uh, the, our sister flight, Rexus 16, was to 86 or 87 kilometers. A question from our signal angel on IRC. Somebody wanted to know what happens to the rocket when it uh, reaches its uh, high point, the highest altitude. Does it come back? Can yes, some parts so be reused, things like that? Yes, so the uh, 80 kilometers are not sufficient to get uh, the experiments into orbit. So basically everything falls down again. There will be, or usually there's a motor separation. So the motor falls down before uh, the payload and then sometime later the payload comes down again. Uh, this is uh, so that the payload uh, falls back on, um, on a parachute. And you can see that here, how it looks like after these couple of slides. So that's just the, the payload without the uh, the motor, that's how it is mounted on the, uh, on the launcher. And that's basically how it, <laughs> how, how Rexus 15 came back. Front left microphone. Uh, I think you missed uh, some of my question. I also wanted to know about the flight duration of uh, Rexus and Rexus as well. So uh, the Rexus flight, uh, this are three minutes up and then probably about, uh, I think, eight minutes or so down. But most of the time is on the parachute, so there's nothing uh, special anymore happening. Um, Vexus is a little bit complicated to say. So, um, for example, our, long, uh, our flight was only about two hours or so. But, for example, one of the last Vexus flights, which uh, fly this year, in October this year, they had a very long flight because um, there were no um, horizontal winds. So um, there are pictures where the balloon was launched two hours ago and they could um, take a photo from the launch pad um, where the balloon was visible in 30 kilometers height. So it could be quite long and it depends on the horizontal winds, for example, and also on the constraints of the experiments. Uh, some experiments want to, want to have uh, um, a long duration of measurement and some experiments want to have a slower duration of flight or of um, floating because, for example, they only want to take measurements in the um, rising and falling of the balloon. Are there any more questions? It does not look like that. So please give a warm round of applause to Panic and Seth. <laughs> <laughs>